Well, it's a really interesting uh, situation. I mean, the war for us only lasted about a year and a half. And in my opinion, we did an awful lot in a year and a half. In other people's opinion, you might not. We may not have, may not have. The question is why and how and uh, basically what happened. It's, um, my talk isn't all that long, I hope. <laughs> I have a reputation for going long. It's well deserved. I hope that won't bore you terribly. <coughs> Unfortunately, since this is more an economic and a political story, it's going to be pretty text heavy. I don't want to wear it for more time. Not lots of pretty pictures of airplanes, although I did find a way to sneak some in. <clears throat> but it's a story of, it's an American history story, and understand that, you understand the background, since what's driving this is economics and politics and the, uh, and the existences of war. In 1913, America was uh, the largest economy in the world, although even we didn't know it. Um, the rest of the world didn't, didn't notice it, but if you took a look at the statistics, uh, in steel production, agricultural production, particularly wheat, coal, just about everything else, we were right up there and it surpassed most of Europe by this time. Um, big advantage for the United States was early in the, eight, the 19th century, we pioneered what was called the American system. We all know it as just mass production, interchangeable parts. You got uh, actually the U.S. Army taught us how to do that at Springfield Armory because the Army needed. Um, weapons with interchangeable parts, they weren't concerned about the cost, so they developed a system of, 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 of making them like that. It was more expensive, actually, to make them on an assembly line at that time, but over uh, with very quickly they realized it was much, much cheaper in the long run to do it that way. And that those techniques made it into uh, American business. Uh, ironically, most of the big leaders in American business were trained <coughs> as civil engineers, and those civil engineers almost exclusively were changed, trained at the U.S. Military Academy. And that's where they learned these techniques and uh, brought them into business at the same time that the economy was growing right before the Civil War and particularly after the Civil War, uh, with a huge you know, expansion of the economy as the westward expansion was going on and big business is growing, large corporations are developing, massive companies like U.S. Steel, this is um, I, uh, a postcard from Pueblo, Colorado, of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company was owned by the Rockefellers, just to give you some idea of the massive power and the smoke <laughs> that uh, industry generated back then. We had, as a nation, had just become an imperial power, 1898, uh, in the Philippines and in Cuba. There was a very narrow margin in the vote of the Senate to go ahead and do that, uh, but we did because uh, we wanted to, we were competing with Europe and wanted to be seen as an equal. We still, however, had a very small frontier army, no more than 100, 150,000 people uh, in uniform. And that was the desire of, the, of George Washington and successive uh, leaders of the nation. Was that they understood that uh, probably at that time, you know, the greatest threat to a democracy would be a very large army um, that could take over. So they wanted to keep it small, Keep enough just to protect the, the borders and the frontier, but that was about it. And of course, well, the United States really wasn't seen as a first rank uh, country by Europe, not yet. They learned very quickly. In 19, between 1914 and 1970, obviously the war broke out in Europe, but we were not, not directly involved, although we were involved from the start. We ostensibly were neutral, and we took great advantage of that, in that uh, we were supplying war materials to both sides for a while, mostly to the French and the British. Um, it really, really helped our economy. Um, we had uh, almost full employment with rising wages, uh, which, is, which is rare then. Most of the corporations in the United States were making huge, huge profits. And um, Europe, well, we, by 1916, uh, the United States held virtually all the world's supply of gold uh, because that's what Europe was paying for all the, the weapons and munitions we were making for them. And then when that ran out, they borrowed very heavily from U.S. banks, so they were beholden to us for just about everything. Um, in May of 1915, of course, the Lusitania was torpedoed. Um, that caused a great deal of public outcry in the United States because of a massive loss of life. What was not reported was that in the, uh, the hold of the ship were munitions headed to Britain. Um, but it helped both the, the fact that it looked, it was 
you know, it looked like a, a, a simple, straightforward torpedoing of a passenger ship. Um, and the fact that, um, you know, the, the money was involved. The uh, public's attention, which I would start, which was sort of split between pro-German and, and, and pro-Allied, sw uh, swung very heavily to um, pro-Allied. Um, at that time, and I can tell you from experience from my family there, you know, about one quarter of the population in the United States is of German, German descent. And there were a lot of uh, pro-German uh, sympathies before this. Um, I remember my grandfather told, telling me that his parents, who were German, um, during World War I, suddenly decided they were actually Swiss. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, you had you know, Liberty Dogs and Liberty This, and Liberty, and you couldn't have a Dachshund, it was a Liberty Dog, that sort of stuff. <laughs> and the, you know, the anti-German sentiment was turned uh, very, very loud after that. The reported um, atrocities the German army supposedly committed in Belgium and all that. Uh, very, the British had a very effective propaganda machine working here. I'm not saying it was a bad thing, but that's what was helping influence uh, United States policy. 1917, we got into the war. Um, a lot of different factors. Uh, in 1916, we thought we could see it coming, uh, so we passed the National Defense Act. It's the first step for preparation. <coughs> Pardon me. The military, United States uh, spending doubled to 618 million. It was about 300 million the year before, and like only 100 million a year or so before that. Um, the U.S. was very, very concerned um, about what was going on uh, in 1916, in particular, at the Somme and Verdun. Both those armies, the British armies, were very, very taxed. Being bled white, very great concern about exhaustion. And of course, the Nivelle Offensive in the spring of 1917 is when the French army did crack. And I don't blame them, to be honest with you. Um, and they mutinied. They, did, they refused to attack. They did not uh, refuse to defend, but they would not attack. And it made everyone very concerned that the French and then maybe even the British, because the British mutiny too, it just wasn't reported, might lose the war. And that collapse would cause um, massive faults on the loans, and it would lead to economic uh, catastrophe in the United States. I'm old school when it comes to the causes of World War I. Uh, yes, remember the Zimmerman note, the, uh, the German uh, uh, the reopening of the uh, um, unrestricted submarine warfare did play a part, but really if you look at it, <clears throat> the kind of money we had invested and the risk of it going under uh, is patently obvious. This was a common belief in the 1930s. Historians after that changed their mind and coming back and forth, but if you just look at it, from my opinion, um, the, the economic, economic side was uh, mm -hmm. one of the primary factors. Um, what was preventing us from getting into the war, well, that's, that's General Neville. Um, it's President Wilson who kept us out of war in 1916. That's how he got re-election, re-elected. Um, the idea being we had to re go into the war to protect the economy. They couldn't because the whole time he was president, he, you know, he was arguing that, that getting the war, but we had to, you know, we're doing this to preserve democracy. Um, but you really can't preserve democracy if one of the allies fighting on the side against the Germans is the most autocratic state on, on the planet, which was Tsarist Russia. So again, look at the timing about this. Um, the February Russian Revolution actually took place in March. We're talking about the old Russian calendar. And um, they removed the Tsar, and they put in place eventually the Kerensky government, uh, which was a democratic government. didn't last all that long um, until the November, well, actually the October Revolution, which was happened in November. But for that period, uh, Russia seemed to be a democracy. Now that led... Uh, gave Wilson uh, uh, the entryway to step in, uh, which we did, and now he could make the world safe for democracy, so now they were only fighting for democracy. And then the war in April 1917. Mobilization of the United States. Um, expenditure increased astronomically, as you expect, uh, from 337 million in 1916 to, well, let's see, uh, over like 6 billion in 1918 and 11 billion uh, uh, authorized for 1919. Astronomical sums of money. 
military expanded in terms of its personnel from 150,000 people in uniform to 2. million by the end of 1918. This is a massive mobilization in less than two years. It's extremely impressive. Um, what was to have a dramatic effect subsequent to World War I was the creation of the command economy. Basically, the government decided and told industry what to build, where to build it, how, and they, uh, how to build it, and um, suspended competitive bidding. Just you get a contract, you get a time, build it, build it fast. Um, massive expansion. They didn't call it the military industrial complex, then. that was an Eisenhower term, but that's exactly what it was. Uh, created the military industrial complex. The problem was there was no uh, government expertise uh, in such a large, uh, creating such a large uh, enterprise, and particularly in uh, manufacture. So they turned to business, which makes sense, because the business leaders knew how to run very large organizations, knew how to produce large, great masses of uh, automobiles, pig iron, you name it, um, and knew how to run large bureaucracies. Because the U.S. government, this bureaucracy was tiny back then. Um, and one perfect example, a good example, of it was the creation of the War Industries Board, which basically directed the economy at the time and issued these orders and contracts. And uh, I love this picture. Um, in April 1917, the United States had the massive number of 224 aircraft in its inventory. The Army uh, very quickly decided they needed 2,500, which is not huge, but a reasonable number. Um, the French were very relieved that we were finally into the war, um, but they were desperate to prevent, to prevent the collapse on the Western Front because at the same time we entered, that's when the Nouvelle Offensive happened and, uh, and the mutinies happened right after that. During the month when the mutinies were, were well, the offensive was stopped and mutinies began, uh, French Premier Alexander Ribot, that's this gentleman here, uh, telegram Wilson, and he asked that the United States produce 16,500 aircraft by June of uh, July of 1918, along with 30,000 engines. That is a phenomenal number. Um, the Joint Army Navy Technical Board, uh, which has been created to uh, as part of the war expansion, recommended 22,000 for 12,000 frontline aircraft and 10,000 trainers. Um, huge sums, and then of course Congress gave appropriated $640 million, which was twice the, the entire, that's just for aircraft and engines, that's twice the number that the, the budget was just two years beforehand for the entire military. Uh, that was for, as you can see, 22,625 aircraft and uh, over 45,000 engines. Very ambitious. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. That's what I meant to do. How do you do it? Well, at that time, the U.S., despite the fact that Wright Brothers invented the aircraft, our industry was not growing. European industry grabbed hold of the airplane and ran with it. We did not. Uh, most people, most countries, companies in the United States were too busy trying to sue one another for patent infringement. Uh, the Wrights were doing it. The other companies were doing it. Uh, just got all tied up in knots. Um, most of the aircraft manufacturers uh, were either controlled or highly influenced by the automobile industry. Logical to make engines. And, uh, the requirement was for a, a tenfold increase in production, and that required the mass production expertise, which only uh, big business could provide. They did form the Manufacturers Aircraft Association, which did pool the patents and the fees. It did sort out that patent mess, but that took some doing. That took several months to get that sorted out. They did, thank fortune. Um, but to get aircraft, to build the numbers they thought they needed, they created uh, what was called the Aircraft Production Board, eventually it was just called the Aircraft Board, under Howard Coffin, he's a name that appears in the 20s and the 30s as well, uh, as one of the leaders in the uh, airline industry. Um, <clears throat> but he was from the Hudson Automobile Company and also from the newly formed Dayton Wright Company. To, uh, and that company was built, uh, designed to build, uh, intended to build um, aircraft. Now, the gentleman who formed Dayton Wright, who was, was a friend of uh, Orville Wright, and was a big player in industry at that time, and particularly in the Dayton region. Dayton is a small city today, but um, 100 years ago, it was a center of industry in the United States, particularly aviation. Uh, National Cash Register was there, uh, still is, although not in the best, best of condition right now. But it was, a, it was a center of manufacturing, a 
especially of, of, uh, of complex machines. So it was a, a, nat a, neat, a natural thing for them to be centered there. Of course, Flight Field is there. Um, the Air Corps, uh, it's the, you know, what the material division there eventually was there. Well, Edward Deeds, who was the founder of Dayton Wright, was appointed as the head of the Aircraft Production Board. And interestingly enough, right after that was commissioned a colonel as the chief of the Signal Corps Equipment Division. And that meant the Signal Corps Equipment Division were the ones that issued the contracts for the aircraft. Interesting coincidence. Um, Still kind of coincidence. A little conflict of interest, perhaps. Um, <laughs> We'll get into, into, a deep, in, into it, but Deeds is a very controversial figure even to this day. Um, was he a patriot? Was he a criminal? Nobody, you really can't say. Uh, built thousands of airplanes, that's not a bad thing, right? But his companies also made an awful lot of money very quickly, and which, depending on your point of view, is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, it depends on what side of the fence you're on. Problem is, though, um, no one had very, had any real experience uh, mass, producing, mass producing aircraft. Um, not by, it should be, but I thought I fixed it. But, uh, uh, but they did have a lot of uh, experience building uh, automobiles. Uh, you know, the Henry Ford, uh, you know, uh, system and all that would, you know, spat out thousands of Model Ts. Uh, very effective, but you know, you've got to be, every machine has to be identical, the parts have to be identical, and interchangeable, I should say. And uh, it made sense in the auto industry, what they didn't quite understand, they didn't quite understand in World War II either, was that while you can, uh, airplanes are a lot more complicated, and because they have a lot more, uh, lots more, a lot more parts, a lot more smaller parts, and the parts have to be made with much greater precision than an automobile does. Uh, but there was a lot to be learned either way. What to build? That's the big question. Well, the Army sent a, a mission to Europe to look, uh, called the, the Bowling Commission, after whom uh, Bowling Air Force Base was named. Uh, Major, and I looked up the pronunciation, I understand it's Ronal, not Renal, but Ronal is in Canal, uh, Bowling. The goal, uh, multiple goals, were to uh, secure the right to, uh, to build European aircraft and the parts necessary for it, select certain aircraft and parts to send to the United States to be examined and tested, Determine how to buy uh, European, European aircraft in the United States. Prepare the U.S. Uh, training program in Europe. And assist the Allies in allocating raw materials. One thing we were, did do throughout the war was provide Europe with a great deal of raw material, aircraft spruce, and all sorts of things you need to build aircraft and other, and other things. Recommendations in terms of what um, you got the aircraft. First was for fighters, buy them from Europe. Um, Fighter uh, technology was evolving very quickly, um, and they felt the Europeans could probably be more adaptable since they had all this experience building fighters, and um, the, te the technology race in fighters was a lot faster than it was in bombers and observation aircraft. So let the Europeans build the fighters and the latest generation, the new ones, and the modifications, and we'll buy the best ones that they have. But we would build the bombers and the observation aircraft, um, and we would build the training aircraft here, and we would use build the bombers uh, based on um, allied designs. Um, of course, the fighter that was recommended was Stad 7. One of the bombers was a Caproni CA-36. Um, that was the idea. The primary aircraft that they recommended was the British de Havilland DH-4, which was a light, uh, light bomber, fighter, observation aircraft, a multi-purpose aircraft. It was controversial from the start. Um, they had defects, both real and imaginary. They, you know, the flying coffin with the, uh, you know, with the, um, there were early versions with the uh, pilot and, and the observer very far apart, separated by a uh, very large gas tank. Um, all sorts of stories about it, not necessarily true or not. Uh, when fitted originally with the, the Liberty engine, was no heavy, very difficult. Um, and it was perceived to have a lot of blind spots. Um, of course, you can pick, pick apart just about any design if you want. And they did. Um, so they decided to select that one for production in the United States, which made sense. Um, and that was produced here as the Dayton Wright, the H4, Dayton Wright, gee, funny. Um, Mr. Deeds' company got the, the order for the primary aircraft to be built here. 
Having said that, they had the facilities, they expanded very quickly, and they did build them in a remarkably short period of time. First flight, October of 1917. First production version, February 1918. First delivery to the front, May 11th, 1918. That's pretty fast. Yeah. Um, they would have delivered more, but uh, May 1918, right after that, um, during one of the, the, the German spring offensives, the, the, the French were screaming for uh, machine guns um, to help stop the German advance. So we stopped delivery of aircraft for a while and just packed the ships with uh, machine guns and ammunition to, to help blunt that. And that was for a good deal of the, of the spring. Uh, so the first US DH-4 squadron did not enter service and fight and fly as a unit until the beginning of August of 1918. Um, you may know, I'm sure you do know, but I had to throw this in there in case you didn't. We owned the very first DH-4, and it's on display downtown. Um, it's really quite pretty, too. And as someone said, it was the first one, so it, it's like a brand new car rolled off the assembly line, and it's completely tricked out with every bell and whistle on it. You, know, you could you know, put the device on it, this one has it. Um, it's really nice. Also, uh, Curtis was, uh, had a contract to build SPAD 13s. Um, they got the contract in October to build 3,000 of them. And then out of the, out of the blue, on an order from Pershing, that uh, that order was canceled. So God knows how much money and time they wasted there. Um, so they ended up purchasing directly from France, about 1,400 of them. Again, another picture of ours. That's a, our SPAD as it rolled out at, uh, at the Carver uh, Center many, many years ago. Just a really pretty picture. I'm a sucker for pretty pictures. <laughs> Probably the one really great success in all of this that uh, doesn't certainly wasn't really recognized at the time was the, uh, the Liberty engine. I love this picture. It's a lovely one of the engine. It's the first uh, uh, B-12, and the officer standing next to it is Hap Arnold. Uh, I don't know which rank. It's probably a major at the time. Um, the idea of this is all about mass production. Think of, like an automobile executive. You need to build a lot of aircraft, different types of aircraft. What are you going to power it with? Well, it'd be a lot easier with one engine. So they very quickly developed this this 400 horsepower engine, which was very powerful, that's the most powerful engine of its time, lightweight considering its size, uh, designed very quickly, supposedly in the Willard Hotel on the weekend, um, and designed completely for mass production. There was nothing on it that was unproven uh, or tricky, and um, but it was unsuitable for all types of aircraft. It's not one size fits all, but it was, a, you know, for what it was and the fact that it was the V-12 version, which was the V-8 one was flown even sooner, but the V-12 version was you know, designed, built, and tested within three months of its design. It's truly remarkable. Um, and by November 1918, uh, almost 14,000 of them had been built. What are the problems? Well, the big problem, the controversy, was that, well, when we promised to build 22,000, that was, if you really think about it, grossly optimistic. Um, in reality, only 196 made it to the front, the H 4s that is. Um, and only 3,432 uh, were built by November of 1918. Um, not the 22,000 that were promised. Still a very impressive number if you really think about it. One of the problems with the DH-4 was the British design. And we find out as we were working on our British aircraft, even through World War II and even later, um, they're not designed for mass production. The, the British would have drawings and send them down to the shop floor. The uh, craftsmen would build the aircraft. They'd find there was something wrong on the drawing. They wouldn't tell the, uh, the engineers and the designers that there was a flaw in the drawing. They'd just fix it. And so basically every British aircraft in World War I, for that matter, so many in World War II, were almost handmade. Uh, the fact that they could spit out so many of them was remarkable, but they really didn't have that many interchangeable parts, and things didn't fit. And then we got the drawings, and we took a look at the airplane that were brought over for the model, and it didn't match. And it, it drove us crazy, because in the United States, you have a drawing, it has to match what's produced, or you don't do it, and it drove them nuts. And a lot of delays in, uh, in getting that done, a lot of delays in getting the standardized drawings, uh, you can imagine the problem when we were building the French and Italian aircraft, the problem of the metric to English conversion, um, because all of the United States industry was, at that time, uh, English standard. Um, 
then of course that embargo slowed deliveries as well. Um, we have time I can tell you stories about the Merlin engine of World War II and the uh, uh, the Trident uh, German uh, the Trident British airliner from the 60s about uh, being hand fitting. Uh, even then they didn't quite get it. The whole idea of a British craftsmanship just the artisan was so hard to get out of their heads, and then of course. United States is all about mass production and interchangeable parts, and it took the British until not all that long ago to finally get it out of their heads. You know, you're not building a Rolls Royce every time you're building an airplane. You know, it's just, it, the parts have to change and be interchangeable. Well, people started asking questions um, as early as October of 1917. The strangest of characters voiced it very loudly. Uh, it's uh, I cannot pronounce it. He, the guy who was of Danish descent, he's American. Uh, Goodson Borglum. Borglum. Thank you. Goodslum. Goodstum. Goodstum. Actually, his first name was John or James. But um, he's a sculptor. He's the gentleman who did um, uh, yeah, Mount Rushmore. Um, not a very nice man. A very egotistical uh, artist. But most art artists are tortured geniuses. Um, he was in, he, on his own. He uh, wrote a letter to Wilson and said, I, I suspect all this, and we need to be investigated. And Wilson said, well, go ahead and take a look. Wilson didn't authorize him to start an investigation, but he sort of thought he did, and he jumped in with both feet. Uh, what he didn't tell Wilson, he had an axe to grind with Deeds, because Deeds had um, commissioned him to, to make a sculpture. I think it was a Orville Wright. And then I uh, did it. Um, did it, and he wanted to build this great mausoleum for somebody, and, and he wanted Deeds to pay for it, and Deeds was like, no thank you, like $50,000, which is an extraordinary amount of money at that time. And, uh, held a grudge against Deeds for doing that, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but uh, didn't do, it wasn't a very objective uh, scientific explanation or examination, but it did uh, expose that there was definitely a lack of production, can't argue that. Uh, but he did have his personal charges against uh, Deeds and others, uh, which did go uh, unsupported. I wrote a, a great quote here. Um, according to him, uh, the expenditures amounted to three times the cost of the Panama Canal, or about $10 for every man, woman, and child in America. The, I love this phrase, the aircraft fiasco was probably the greatest financial failure in human history. Okay. Tell, tell us what you really feel. <laughs> you know, um, a little overstated, perhaps, but um, people were listening. You know, you, you smell corrupt. Think, you, know, you think there's corruption. You smell a problem. Um, where there's smoke, there's fire. Is the assumption? Of course, he had his personal problems with deeds and others, and you just run with it, tell half truths or whatever, and it uh, got the ball rolling. It truly did. Uh, Wilson was definitely, he wasn't real thrilled with, uh, with Borum, but he did listen, and the Senate and the House were again becoming increasingly alarmed that these 22,000 airplanes were not magically appearing. Um, frankly, they shouldn't have you really think about it. But theirs was an objective investigation that, throughout 1918, and they had three conclusions which are, are which indeed are reasonable. Um, these are quotes from them. It said, you know, the aircraft uh, program was placed in control of the automobile of the manufacturers who did not, were not familiar with uh, the problems of building airplanes. Um, they took what they considered an impossible task of creating a motor, which could be adapted to all classes of aircraft. A superb engine, but no, you can't, it, one size does not fit all. And, quote, we failed at the beginning of the war to adopt the common sense course of reproducing the most approved types of European machines in as great numbers as possible. Yes and no. I mean, the DH-4, uh, the, the, the things you hear about the DH-4 being as, you know, the flaming coffin and all that sort of stuff, gross exaggeration. It wasn't the best thing out there, but it was, it was adequate for its time and um, led to other aircraft as well. But, you know, do the best with what you have. So that was a reasonable uh, complaint. But following the Senate hearings and the House hearings, um, one of the, the Associate Chief Justice, Charles Evans Hughes, soon to be Secretary of State, uh, had his own investigation. And he was more concerned about the perceived uh, charges of graft and corruption. He was, and he went after Colonel Deeds. Um, and things he said were 
very, very strong. Actually, requested the deed to be court-martialed um, and thrown in, in jail. Uh, didn't happen, but he felt that strongly about it. But he was looking for criminal charges. Now, um, if you take a look at it, uh, some of the companies made an awful lot of money very quickly. And Dayton Wright was one of them. They had a million dollar investment in putting up their factory, and they made six million dollars by the end of 1918. Uh, that is an extraordinary return on investment. Uh, Packard, uh, the aircraft engine manufacturer, automobile manufacturer, uh, made six and a half million from a six million dollar investment within just a matter of months. And others as well. Now, on the surface, without explaining this, it looks really bad. And we had a popular revulsion to all this, what appeared to be excess, of prof excess profits. And perhaps it, they, many were. Um, but that's the problem when you, you know, uh, quickly expand any economy, any production like that. Um, there are mistakes. There are overcharges and whatnot. And it just takes a while to sort it out. Um, this, did was a, this was a precursor to uh, the Cora Commission in the 1930s and the publication of a book called The Merchants of Death, which... Um, painted all the munitions manufacturers of World War I in the United States as persons of death. I mean, how do you argue? I mean, <laughs> you're going to look bad no matter what uh, when you're in the Senate hearing and someone says, well, you made X money, millions of dollars while Americans died, blah, blah, blah. Well, looks bad. And that's, that's where that started. How, that does, looks, how does a member of the judici judiciary end up investigating, a, a member of the judicial branch invest, end up investigating something in the it was set up with the, with the approval of Wilson. Oh, it was like, okay, okay. we need it. He set up, he was in, uh, set up as an independent commission to, to look at it. Okay. I, I was wondering, he may not have been on the Supreme Court at that time, because I, I think Hughes had been an associate justice, and I think he may have left the court to run for president in 1916. Possibly. I, I don't know that much about him. He's one of these characters. Well, I mean, he's been a governor. He was a, um, I mean, he served the country in yeah. many different ways. Yeah, and then later was Secretary of State. So, I mean, it was a very accomplished person. Yeah. Um, the thing about the hearings there, I mean, it, it looked really bad for Deeds, and it, it tarred Deeds for years. And Deeds may have, you know, all the charges may have been true. He just never got to, never got to trial for any of them. Um, and so that left up, you know, when in the 30s, when the Merchants of Death were... Uh, accusations came out, they dredged up the whole thing about Deeds and others. And he was, Deeds was you know, a very powerful man. And his friends were as well. Uh, again, all in Ohio and Dayton, you know, the Fred Rentschler of uh, Pratt and Whitney, he was from there, from a, that area, and others. And it all looked like this cabal to some people. Um, flip side is that's just what's the center of the industry, of, you know, of the industry at the time. It's just the way it is. And you send, you know, if you're going to build lots of airplanes and there's the company's going to do it, you give them contracts to do it. But it does look bad if you were running the company now in another hat, wearing another hat, you're giving that con that same company uh, the juiciest of contracts. It certainly looks bad. Um, who knows? Um, also driving this was after 1920, uh, a lot of partisan politics. There was a general revulsion in the United States after, after the war. Things just didn't quite go the way we wanted. Um, Wilson was trying to get us in the League of Nations, and most Americans wanted to get back to um, quiet, safe, protective existence behind both oceans and leave Europe to itself. Get back into an isolationism. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, that's just the way most people felt. Republicans took control of the, of the, of the Congress. And, you know, obviously they blame, as you would imagine, whoever's in power blames the outgoing administration of all sorts of things. The uh, billion dollar bond fire where they literally burnt uh, lots of aircraft in Europe rather than send them back to the United States didn't help the situation any. Um, it's perfectly logical. It costs more to pack them up and ship in here. You weren't going to use them anyway. Um, might as well destroy them. But again, on the surface, it didn't look good. Um, and in 1920 20, 20 and 21, a lot of uh, articles were written. Um, there's a story in. New York Times Current History, written, uh, uh, let's see, by H.L. Uh, Schaaf, who was a, a captain in the Army at the time, and he comes out withering, withering uh, article that um, helps, help, 
helped set the tone, if I may quote on this one, um, talking about uh, the DH-4, uh, that they have on fours being useless for purposes of combat. Uh, the qualified statement that not a single fighting plane of American made of American make reached the front during the period of war can can be accepted as an historic fact. You know, they're useless for combat and none made in the front. And that was the claim throughout this, and a lot of people believe that it was not a useless aircraft. It had its problems, but it was not useless. And as we know, almost 200 of them were there, with 3,000 soon to, soon to arrive, and God knows how many more was going to happen in 1919. But that's not what the public could see. They didn't see the difference in the details. They saw this, and they saw and heard stories like that. A lot of overstatement. Reality, there's a lot of truth to what the people were complaining about. It was too ambitious. Uh, a little bit of pride and hubris in it. Said, yeah, yeah, American mass, mass production can do anything. Yeah, we go from 200 aircraft to 20,000 in, in a year, sure, no problem. Well, yeah, it was a problem. Um, everywhere you, you look a lot, it does, really doesn't look like there was fraud, at least not on a significant scale. On the surface, it didn't look good, but look down deep, not really. Um, in the case of starting any new industry up from nothing, there are huge upfront capital expenses that were that Uncle Sam paid for. <coughs> um, that would have been evened out had the war continued. Um, there's a steep learning curve in aircraft production. That, too, was evening out uh, when the war ended, uh, much sooner than anyone expected. Good thing, but that's what happened. Um, I found this quote from a historian, Paul Hare, who wrote all about this, a really good um, article about it. And the quote is, it's perfect about war production. So the first year, nothing. Second year, a trickle. Well, that second year was 1918. The third year, all you want. Well, that would have been 1919. Now, if it's counterfactual <coughs> history, which is bad history, to say what would have happened, what could have happened, because we don't know, because it didn't happen. But what we do know is that the United States had a whole series of fighters and bombers and observation aircraft under development that were high, you know, were very high performance aircraft, particularly the, um, uh, the LUSAC, uh, LePair, however you should call it, Tommy Morse MV3, the, the Martin bomber was just coming out. Um, all sorts of air, uh, good new designs, the domestic designs, were being produced. Um, the, and Liberty was, was there, as were other really fine engines. Uh, the Hispano Suiza, a 300 horsepower version, was being built by Wright Martin. Bugatti was building in the United States, Packard as well. Um, 1919, uh, remember, the, 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 um, the budget for 1919 was well over a billion dollars, which is an astronomical <coughs> sum of money. The skies over Europe probably would have been filled with American aircraft, uh, but they weren't. So because that didn't happen, you know, the $640 million expenditure on aircraft was considered to be a total waste of money, uh, the greatest fraud in human history, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all the Germans' fault for surrendering so early. Yes, it was. <laughs> Morning. <No. laughs> um, Probably the best way to sum this up, and it might be a little, forgive me for reading to you, but um, this is from Ed, Edgar Gorell's The Measure of America's War Effort, something he wrote in 1940, right before we got into World War II. And he was part of the Bowling Commission, and he saw all this very up close and firsthand, and took exception with a lot of these, uh, these claims. But if I may, in his conclusion of this, it pretty well sums up what I'm thinking as well. It says, our World War Aeronautical effort resulted in a little understood, but yet an, in, un, an enviable achievement. We started with nothing, not even blueprints, not even experience. We succeeded, succeeded in building a splendid Air Force, in placing desirable American-built planes at the front, which is true, in creating and supplying one of the best, if not the best, of all aeronautical engines, and in supplying vast qualities of, quantities of sorely needed material to our allies. After the war, this effort was belittled and misrepresented. Patriotic Americans, particularly those who had labored well on this side, were attacked. Their great mistake had been that they had originally promised too much in a burst of unfounded optimism. For the record speaks well of their accomplishments in the face of almost insurmountable obstacles. And considering this was written in 1940, this is very prescient. Yes. If, it, if, if it ever happens again, let us hope that we will be neither so unprepared nor too optimistic Aeronautical warfare requires the expenditure of much, both in men and material. We cannot afford to be caught with empty hands or to lull our people with promises of a capacity greater than we have. Very true. And because of that, when World War II came around, we were 
Um, the stories are that we weren't ready when Pearl Harbor happened. That's not quite true. Everything in the pipeline just hadn't made it to the front yet. Um, we were rebuilding as early as 1938 with lessons of World War I in hand and um, building massive factories all over the country, supplying the Allies once again before war broke out for us. And uh, when the war did break out for us, uh, we had this massive pipeline, massive production going, uh, which fed our war machine. And from the lessons learned with the command economy then, we instituted another one and uh, built you know, huge uh, federal enterprise to get this built and get it done. And uh, it worked in World War II and based very, very largely on the lessons of World War I, good and bad. So the conclusion is, as I said, I'm being a historian, I, I come to definite conclusions. So was it a success or a failure? The answer is, well, yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good.